history which was there was to justify the, uh, their coming. So we were told uh, Africa was a dark continent and uh, these were the people who were to bring uh, in the light. My name is uh, John Kamau. Uh, I work as a journalist, but uh, mostly on historical stuff, and uh, I'm trained as a historian. Uh, in school, uh, we were taught about uh, the colonial adventures in this country, and uh, most of the people who went through the early history of this country, they actually taught about uh, colonial history and uh, that uh, trying to justify the essence of the colony. And if you look at the early works of history, you'll find the uh, people, children were taught about uh, Vasco da Gama, they were taught about the Portuguese, they were taught about uh, the governors who came, they were taught about the Imperial British East Africa Company, they were taught about, taught about the railway, they were taught that uh, the Maasai were warlike, and, and those were the characteristics of the Maasai, they were taught about the, the tri tribes and that the tribes were always fighting. That is, that is a narrative which was fed as part of our history. And uh, within time we lost uh, what our, where our history is. And uh, we could not be able to narrate our history and, uh, until it came to a point where historians started to question, where is our history? Because uh, the kind of history which we are teaching is the history of the colony. So where, where were we within this colony? What were we doing? And uh, that is where you find uh, you don't get much thought about our, our fight against the colonialism. You don't find the uh, children being taught about the essence of Mau Mau. You don't uh, find them uh, being taught uh, that this struggle started a long time ago that there were people who came here, they had not been uh, called by anybody, they just arrived and they started uh, you know, el elbowing their way into our territory. And then uh, the history which was there was to ju justify the, uh, their coming. So we were told uh, Africa was a dark continent and uh, these were the people who were to bring uh, in the light. If you look at the, even the history of South Africa, they say that uh, everybody migrated from somewhere and they, they all arrived at the same time. So even here, uh, if you look at uh, the, the kind of history which was being taught, it's about the migrations. Why well, were we being taught, taught, taught about uh, that we all migrated from the Congo? It is to justify that everybody has come here. So this is nobody's land. Everybody is an alien here, and you all came here. But when you go to the archaeological record, you find that archaeological record has records from the Stone Age, the Late Stone Age, the Middle Stone Age, the Later Stone Age, the Iron Age. So you don't see that migration happening because uh, you have this historical record which shows that there were, this land was occupied for millions of years. So it was never vacant. But nobody still talks about that one. So all what we are told is that uh, we all migrated. The Bantus uh, came from Congo. I see if there was a reservoir there maybe of uh, people. Uh, that uh, there were people who came from the north and they arrived here and uh, you wonder why we were not migrating to the other areas so we, everybody was uh, heading to Kenya so it was just a justification of the colony and uh, for me I never agree with that uh, uh, that theory that uh, we were migrating uh, here from uh, Congo because I see it as a uh, part of uh, that colonial project to justify uh, the essence that they can also say we also migrated from Europe. So you cannot say that you owned this land. We also came, the Portuguese came, the Swahili came, the Arabs came. You also came from Congo, you can also go back. So nobody has the right to justify that uh, they owned this place uh, simply by arriving first. What we have, uh, the first contact with the outsiders uh, is at the coast. And I think uh, the likes of uh, Ibn Battuta, uh, at the coast, uh, when you look at the Gedi ruins, we have got the, it offers us the contact with the other countries. Uh, there was trade at the coast, which was uh, continuing uh, between uh, 
the locals and the other people. After, after the Portuguese uh, came and they managed to, they were fighting with the Arabs, then we see a lot of uh, stuff happening and uh, that is when uh, Otto, Otto von Bismarck calls the meeting in Berlin to discuss the fate of, uh, the fate of uh, Africa, uh, the entire Africa, or what is called, called the Scrabble for Africa. And uh, you remember for three months they held a meeting trying to cut up uh, Africa into small parcels because they didn't want to have to fight over a continent. They wanted a peaceful transfer of this uh, continent among themselves. So they met and they decided like, uh, we are going to take this piece, we are going to take this piece. And uh, before that, you know, we had the, all these explorers who are trying to stamp their authority in various uh, areas. So you have the German East Africa, where Kina Sita, Kina Dr. Krafo. And uh, then you have uh, the people who are coming to, to Kenya and they were all trying to stamp their authority there. So after the, the partition, now you find uh, now the Imperial British East Africa Company being formed by, formed by Mackinon so that uh, he can be able to collect taxes and administer this on behalf of uh, British authorities. So he got uh, the Royal Charter to administer this, uh, uh, this part of the country. And nobody is concerned about the locals. It's like uh, we, we, we don't exist. Mm. If you look at uh, even uh, those explorers when they are walking around, they are coming with the, uh, they're just finding their, their roots, they're scouting for it, the source of uh, River Nile. They are walking around, they are shooting people, they are shooting game, they are taking away, cutting away ivory and all that. So no, nobody is concerned with us. It's like we don't exist uh, anywhere. If you block them, they shoot. They, had, they were shooting their way to wherever they want. Because remember, they had the, the boxing gun. Mm -hmm. Either they give you the clothing, the, 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 the clothing. if you don't, they will shoot you. We see the missionaries arrive, uh, we see them arrive in uh, Rabai, where they set camp, uh, I think the first camp there. And uh, they build their small church there. Mm -hmm. Then they come to Kibwezi. Then after Kibwezi, they came to St. Austin in Nairobi. From St. Austin, uh, they spread into Dogoto. Uh, then they went to Kahu here. They went to Mutumutumu. They went to Tudu, where they worked with the chief there. Uh, in all these places, they were working with the ch local chiefs uh, who had been uh, now being appointed by the Imperial British East Africa and uh, also later the protectorate. Their work uh, was to Christianize, Christianize the so-called uh, Dark uh, Continent as part of uh, the entire colonial project where faith, the faith and the gun came, followed the same path. So the path which was followed by the faith and the path which was followed by the sword it was the same path. So you find them uh, coming in into the interior, establishing the uh, mission stations, uh, and the mission sta stations became the recruiting ground for faithfuls. And these faithfuls, they will become uh, later the people who are going to be used by the colony to have some kind of uh, elite, uh, some, some elite, uh, an elite group will be used uh, against the people. And uh, they have the hospitals, uh, they have the missions, and they are now training the locals to become uh, good boys so that uh, you don't just attack the, the Wazungus. So they, they, they are also, uh, in terms of uh, recruiting, they are recruiting people into either to become good people so that they don't aspire for much uh, in this world. What you can aspire for is for the kingdom of heaven. We, we had the uh, church missionary societies, we had the Catholics, they had uh, their own. There are, there are various, uh, various groups uh, which were coming, they had the Scottish, and they were all fighting for space. So if you look at uh, the distribution of the missionaries in Kenya, you're going to see that uh, they had taken zones. So if you go to Meru, you find the, the Methodists, that's where they are entrenched. If you go to Nyeri, you find the, the PCA, that is where they are entrenched. You go to Machakos, you find the, there's another group there. You go to the Rift Valley, 
you find the, the there's another group which was there. So they had they had their own zones. Mm -hmm. They had demarcated this land in terms of uh, if you go to the Goto, those are the Scottish. So the Scottish are going to to be there. You go to Muranga, the upper Muranga, you find the Catholics. They are there, and the Anglicans. They are the only ones uh, operating there. The PCA, they are pushed to Tomotomo, the Presbyterians. So they, are, they have divided the country into small, small sections that you operate from here, you operate from here. And if you look today, you can see where, where they are. If you go to Machakos, the, just near the police station, you are, you are going to see the, there are two pillars there. And uh, these two pillars, they signify where the fort uh, was. They are part of the original fort which was built there by John uh, Ainsworth. And uh, they were hoping that uh, even Machakos would become the headquarters of the Imperial British uh, East Africa, where they would be collecting taxes, they would be administrating this land. <coughs> they were also building the railway. The problem was that the Mackinons, uh, Imperial British East Africa, was also becoming uh, broke. They had no money, but uh, Ainsworth continued working there without uh, a salary and uh, later on uh, he was told now you have to follow the railway and you have to go to Nairobi and set up a, a new station. So he followed uh, the railway people and he comes to establish uh, Nairobi as a town. So Nairobi was the second station uh, for the Imperial British uh, East Africa and uh, if, you, if you go to Moy Avenue you're going to find uh, a building called the uh, IBA building. It is still there, small building there, about uh, two floors. And uh, they say it later became a... Uh, it wasn't his office, uh, because his office was in uh, where, near where the police station is. That's where he had built a Mabati office. And then he had built his house uh, uh, in national museums, in the national museums compound. But he managed to administrate uh, Nairobi in a way that uh, he made it uh, hospitable for the colonial government. Uh, all the best land had been taken by the railway, but uh, what he did was to come and plant all the trees. So he brought all those eucalyptus trees you see in Nairobi. He brought them from Machakos. If you look at the lining up of uh, the eucalyptus trees in Machakos and the eucalyptus uh, trees in Nairobi, it follows the same path because he was a horticulturist and uh, he was trying to beautify Nairobi. So that is the second station for Imperial British South Africa now before the, it was later, later overtaken by the protectorate. Now the company is no longer, you know, previously it was a private company which had been given the contract to do this. Imperial British East Africa is a company. It was just correct. It's a company given a, a contract to do something for a commission on behalf of the British, uh, for Her Majesty. But now, with the protectorate, now they are appointing their own uh, governors to come and uh, administrate. And we see now the movement uh, from Mombasa. You know, officials, government officials now coming into the interior. Now they are in charge of the, the land. So it's now part. We are, we are now on the way to become a, a colony. Okay. Yeah, we are not going to be administered as a colony, mm -hmm. but uh, the colony comes later in 1920. And all these things are happening. Uh, laws are being passed. Uh, you find uh, when they were building the, um, the railway, we gazetted some laws, especially on land. So we borrowed uh, some laws from Indian uh, property laws, Indian uh, land uh, laws, which had been used there to in the building of the uh, Indian uh, railway system to acquire the land. So all the land became crown land. So when all land becomes crown land, it means that uh, the land within Kenya, it doesn't matter whether it's a traditional or, or whatever, now you are dealing with a crown land. So the land which you are thinking you own, there's a new law in town which says that uh, this land does not belong to you. It now belongs to the crown. And uh, those are the laws which were enacted uh, in this country, early, very early enough. Look at the, the building of the railway. It was passing through people's uh, properties, people's lands. And uh, we see now the, the settlers, 
you know, after the building of the railway, you see now the settlers being told you can now come and settle and the farm so that you can grow the cash crop to help us to repay the money for the railway. So the first very effect was the pushing of people from the fertile lands into dry lands so that you can give way to the colonial settlers. So that is the very first thing that happened. So you fight all these uh, uh, guys who are arriving. Uh, they, ha they had now built uh, the Norfolk in 1904 there. Mm. They are arriving in Norfolk, they are arriving in Nairobi, speculators, large speculators. The lads office had been opened. Everybody is uh, swarming in there. There is a lot of uh, advertising in Europe that uh, there is a uh, lad in uh, Africa. You can now go there and farm. And uh, people are scouting, moving around, scouting for lad, putting beacons. And uh, once you put a beacon, you go to the lad's office and uh, you are given the title to that land. That is what was happening. And you can push around everybody who is within that, uh, that farm. The Ascaris are there. The, the far, these people, they are all armed. Mm -hmm. And mark you, the, the territory, you know, they were not, uh, the population was that, not that huge. So you're talking about uh, small villages occupying a, uh, if I, the population of Kenya at that time, it was less than uh, 2 million there, the entire population. So you can imagine they were sitting on a huge lad. So to intimidate people out of uh, such lad, uh, it would be very easy for a guy who, who has the guns and all that. Carmen Zagen uh, is a peculiar character. He was a, a non-ethologist uh, and also a, ma a mercenary, kind of. And uh, when, when he comes here, he's a guy who was very notorious for conducting raids. So anybody who was resisting the change, he would go to Muranga. And uh, if you had attacked a white man, he's the one who was to come to follow it up with uh, his Ascaris. And he, he would do that as a punishment. And the punishment uh, which was done to communities was the seizing of their cows and goats. So they would come and seize the, the cows and goats as punishment. They would burn houses. They would kill uh, children, uh, men and women in a shooting spree. So that uh, any, other, any, other, um, any other community which uh, would like to resist, that is what they would face. And uh, that, is, that was the why the understanding what Carmen Sagan was doing is very important for this country. The fight in uh, Mbiri, uh, where he, in order for them to build the Muranga, the modern day Muranga town, which was the Fort Hall, and uh, he had uh, those uh, escapades in uh, um, with the, what he calls the people of Mbiri, and uh, he killed so many people there. And uh, that explains why, when you're looking in Muranga, at Muranga town, is built on, uh, on top of a hill because of the security purpose. If you look at uh, towns like Nyeri, they are also built uh, on top of a hill because of the same escapades uh, which uh, he took to the people of uh, Teto when they resisted. Uh, there was also the massacre among the in, in the Rift Valley. Uh, there was also the massacre in, in uh, Kehumbuini where he, uh, Amzungu had been killed and uh, he led, he led uh, his Ascaris to kill so many people in Kehumbuini. So all these have been documented and uh, he also writes about them in his diaries as if uh, he's glorifying the kind of uh, terror he did.